quite honored to be here and, and uh, honor Brother and Sister Brown on their anniversary. 29 years is a long time to be married to the wrong woman. Right. Or the wrong man. So I know their life has been nothing but pleasure. They're wonderful people. Laurel is blessed of the Lord to have Brother Brown in this city. And I am wanting to see you get a break and begin to fill up some empty space. And uh, I don't know. Sometimes different things happen to bring a break. I, I know of one brother... You won't mind standing a moment, will you? All right. A good friend of mine, a brother, stayed in one place. I believe it was six years. My memory doesn't fail me. He never got over 20 in the congregation. And uh, his wife said, there, it just looks like we're not going to have a move of God. Why don't we just resign and and let the people go where they'd like to go. And, and he prayed and he said, Lord, I have given you six years of my time. Now, what's the, my, uh, the problem? Am I the problem? Whatever there needs to be, uh, make a change. And uh, he went out to service the next, uh, very next service on Sunday, and they had three. Him, his wife, and three others. There was five of them. And um, he said, well, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do. And about that time, a car pulled up the driveway. And uh, a family got out and walked in, and they said, um, have you all started yet? said, we uh, were just passing through. We thought we'd stop being service with you. So that family made the five up to about nine or ten. And uh, he preached to them. And the Lord blessed them. They went on their way and came back by and stopped again. Well, this time when they stopped, uh, two of them prayed through to the Holy Ghost. And he baptized them in a big old spring that was right close to the church. And um, they went on their way. But on their way through the little town that was adjacent to that community. They stopped at a restaurant and was telling some people about receiving the Holy Ghost and being baptized in Jesus' name in one of the cleanest, coolest springs they had ever seen. And some people heard the testimony and they came down to the church and within a matter of three or four months that church grew to over 100 people. But it set that. Set that. Six years six years it sat there now brother brown's been here i believe about five years i would like to think that i had been instrumental in helping a church just a little bit if you could live for god a little bit longer just one more day it would make me feel good i would feel good that i had been instrumental in assisting you along your journey with the lord but a few years ago in 1980, I got very disturbed about the financial condition of our church and the people that I pastored. It grieved me that here was people that had been baptized in Jesus' name, been filled with the Holy Ghost, and uh, they were living in such poor, destitute conditions. And there never seemed to be enough money to pay the bills around the church. Just never was enough. And uh, I asked the Lord why his people had to live in that kind of a condition. And the Lord just seemed to speak back to me and said, My people don't have to live that way. All right. All right. Thank you, Jesus. All right. I've made a way for them to get out. Well, it was baffling to me. I didn't quite grasp that. And then the Lord spoke one other word and He said, it's in my book. And I began to seek for God's plan. 
And Brother Brown, after praying and searching, I found it. I found it. When I preached it the first time to the people I pastored, I did such a poor job that many of them didn't grasp it. But I knew I had found the key. I knew it. The anointing I felt, the, the atmosphere. I began to do more research on it. And I preached it again. And this time a few more grasped it. And after I preached it the third time, about 85% of our church had grasped it. And they had begun, <coughs> excuse me, they had begun to live it. They'd begun to apply it to their life. And Sister Brown, in just one year, less than a year, I was pastoring a totally different church. I mean a totally different church. I'm telling you, it was totally different. We were having revival and not having to pray for revival. Oh, hallelujah. It is absolutely unscriptural to pray for revival. We are supposed to be involved in revival. We make revival happen by living according to this book. And when we live by this book, Revival is among us. Give the Lord a big old praise clap. Now, I appreciate my fine pastor and friend, Brother Larry Hoyt, chauffeuring me up here in that nice, pretty, clean, white Lincoln. I could have rode in the back seat. <clears throat> if I'd have had my Stetson, I'd have done that and made it look real good you know but he's such a gentleman and I promise you one thing uh, he was merely carrying on a little bit about the statement uh, that he wasn't paying me enough <clears throat> I'm here because I love brother and sister Brown and I'm here because I want to see you grow and I'm here because I want to see you blessed praise God hallelujah if you'll turn with me to the book of uh, 1 Timothy, and I'm going to read from verse number 3, and I'm going to read one verse of Scripture, and that's verse number 15. After that, we'll have our fine pastor pray, and uh, then we'll have a lot of other Scripture. I'm going to ask you one other question before I read the Word of God. How many of you genuinely, sincerely, with no hypocrisy in it, want your church to be a Bible church in practice and in word? You want it to be a Bible church. I want you to lift your hands. If you want to be part of a Bible church, well, I see some of you didn't raise your hand, so we'll... I caught you, sister. Oh, I'm always doing that. <laughs> I want a Bible church. I'm going to tell you this, that I have preached this message in 11 other churches before tonight other than the churches I've pastored. Not one of them have rejected it. If you reject this message tonight, you're the first one that's rejected it. And then uh, I, I had one pastor to tell me recently that there was a few people in the church he pastored that had rejected it. He said, everyone in the church that has put it to practice have rapidly been blessed. <laughs> Them that rejected it are on a steady decline. Right, right. Those that put it to practice, their income has increased. Those that rejected it, their income has begun to decrease. Now, uh, the churches that I've preached it in, the, and Pastor Hoyt has heard these reports, revival, um, immediately when they begin to ooh, practice it, revival begins to blossom. 
So people begin to get blessed. People come to church that they don't even know. Uh, Their financial woes begin to fade away. And people are blessed financially. The church loses its financial problems. It's unscriptural for God's church to be in financial despair. Give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. I feel Holy Ghost all over here. Hallelujah. But if I tarry long, that thou oughtest to know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, if you paid attention to what I read, the Apostle Paul addressing Pastor Timothy called the church building the church of God. He called the building the church of God. He called the building the pillar and the ground of the truth. We may not be as building conscious as we ought to be. There's something special about our meeting place. And sometimes we as Pentecostals are very negligent in our conduct in the house of God. And we are so negligent about some of our worship. One of the most important worshiped Our most important parts of our worship is not the singing. It's not the clapping of our hands. It is the receiving of the offering. All right. And God spoke to me when I inquired of Him the problem. And God said it's in my book. And I found in His book that our churches are in problems today because of the way they give. And I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm not going to slip in the back door and try to trick you. I'm going to preach about giving tonight. And if you're going to be offended about money, it would be better that you left now. Because the Word of God says, Happy are they that love the the Word of the Lord, and nothing in this Word will offend them. I'm not offended by anything I can find in this book. And I promise you one thing. I will not preach to you theory. I will not preach to you philosophy. I'm going to bring you the unadulterated word of the living God. If you reject that, you're not rejecting me. If you reject the word, you're rejecting him. Hallelujah. Everybody say praise God. Everybody say hallelujah. Pastor Brown, entreat the Lord. Loving God again. Thank you, Father. We're thankful, Lord, for the Spirit of God that we have felt and what we're feeling now. Thank you for the reading of the Word of the Lord. We need this message tonight, and I'm asking your great anointing and hallelujah upon the man of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody shake hands with each other and say, I'm going to begin to prosper. I'm going to begin to prosper. Tonight. 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 I've already started, but I'm going to get another start. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. You may be seated. Give the Lord a big praise clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The night I preached this message message in Columbia where Brother James Carney is pastor, I, I preached it on Sunday morning while we were receiving the offering Sunday night. While people walked down the aisle worshiping God with their offering. The glory of God fell in that building 
and two brand new people, a man and wife, got under conviction and prayed through to the Holy Ghost while an offering was being taken up. While an offering was being taken up, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, preaching about giving and about money does not kill a service. When it's the Word of God, it will make a service live. Hallelujah. I'm going to show you how to get out of poverty. I'm going to show you how to prosper. I'm going to show you to have better than you've ever had. I'm going to show you how to fill your church house up. I'm going to show you how to solve problems. I'm going to show you how to get rid of sickness. Well, hallelujah. There's a few little keys. We're going to read a few scripture. Pastor Brown, the second book of Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 20. Your receptivity or your, of uh, the blessings of God depends on how well you receive what I preach tonight. I practice what I'm fixing to preach tonight. All right. And I have practiced it for years. And I'm going to tell you about some people whom I pastor and about some others that I don't pastor in churches I've preached it in whose financial condition has turned completely around. People that were on welfare and never dreamed of a better day that the minute they put this into practice, in four days they had already been blessed of God more than they'd ever received on welfare. Hallelujah. Read us that scripture, Brother Brown. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and, and went forth into the wilderness. And went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth. And as they went forth. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat stood and said. Hear me. Hear me. Oh Judah. Oh Judah. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord. Believe Christ. in the Lord thy God. So and so shalt thou be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall you prosper. The key tonight is believing what I preach because it's from the pages of God's never dying word. Hallelujah. Everybody say praise the Lord. Now I'm going to use some Old Testament scripture. All right. Just in case you're one of those that feels that the Old Testament is invalid, I have something for you tonight. Second Corinthians, my good brother, I'd like for you to read for me chapter 3 and verse 16. This is in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I want to use the Word of God to validate everything I preach tonight. I, I said Corinthians, but Timothy, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And uh, we'll see what the Word of the Lord says. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Just the New Testament is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. All. All. Well, now listen. That's under the law. All. all scripture now I want you to understand when Paul wrote these words there was no New Testament he was helping to write it then when he said all scriptures given by inspiration of God he meant from Genesis to Malachi and he did not leave out any of it all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine. For reproof. For correction. For correction. For instruction in righteousness. That 
the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now that's in the book. And now somebody tell me the Old Testament isn't valuable. I can preach doctrine from it. And whether we believe it or not, giving is doctrine. I'm going to show you one of the most beautiful parts of the Old Testament. But first, another scripture. The Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 24. And I, I believe, I, I thought I might have this. Verse 44, I believe it is. Luke 24, 44. I'm just establishing a little guideline to work from tonight. And he said unto them, I am clarifying the validity of using the Old Testament for doctrine. Now, I wouldn't need another scripture to do it. The one that Jesus, uh, that Paul gave us is sufficient. That's sufficient. When he told that young pastor, all of the scripture from Genesis to Malachi is given by inspiration of God. Boy, don't you leave none of it out. It's profitable for doctrine. Hallelujah. Now look at this one. And he said unto them, These are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That a few things, there's that word all again, all things must be fulfilled future. Future tense. All right. Future tense. Yes. Must be they must be fulfilled. We are going to have to fulfill all of them. All of them. Read the rest of it. Yes. Which were written in the law of Moses. Which were written. Oh, you mean I. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Future tense. They must be fulfilled. Which were written. In the law of Moses, and in the, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Hallelujah. Everything pertaining to God has got to be fulfilled in the house of God today. Stand up and give him a big prayer. me we don't have a choice he said we've got to do it it must be fulfilled every commandment giving concerning him or his house has to be fulfilled by us you may be seated Everybody said, Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to show you something. This is not a 30 minute sermon, folks. All right. I wouldn't mess this up for nothing in the world. Uh, brother, I want you to get for me Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12. I'm going to show you something in the book. It's unscriptural for a church to borrow money. If we'd have got with God's plan years ago, we wouldn't have to beg these old greedy banks for money. We wouldn't have to mortgage houses and everything else to get them to loan us a few thousand dollars. But you, we missed it somewhere along the line. And brother, I got desperate with God because my people were in poverty and I wanted to know why they were there. And God let me know that I had failed them in not preaching His plan. I'm going to show you how the church is supposed to be. Read us beginning at verse 12. The Lord shall open unto thee. The Lord shall open unto thee. His good treasures. His good treasures the heavens. To give the rain. Unto thy land. Unto thy land in, his in his season. And to bless all the work. And to bless, all, and to bless a little of what you all. do. 
You see, God's got a plan. That I don't care what you do. When we get with that plan, God will bless everything that we do. He said, I'll bless all the work of your hands. It's just a, everything you do, He'll bless you. I will bless all the work of your hands. That means He'll bless your witnessing when you invite somebody to the house of God. He'll bless your garden when you sow the seed. He'll bless your business when you go in business. Everything you do will have the blessing of God on it. There'll be no failures. There'll be no bankruptcies. Hallelujah. And thou shalt lend and, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt, and thou shalt not borrow. borrow. <laughs> if I had known this, Brother Brown, when I started building home mission churches, I'd have never borrowed a dime. I'd have instituted God's plan immediately. And by the time we got a congregation together, we'd have had the money to build with. We'd have never mortgaged a church building. Oh, <laughs> Hallelujah. More problems have come in churches over money than anything else. Adultery don't cause as much trouble as money. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. If you don't get victory over money, you're susceptible to every evil known to man. I got book on you now. If you don't have victory over your pocketbook, if, you're, if your pocketbook ain't sold out to God, if you still love money, you're a tight wad. You are susceptible to lying, stealing, immoral conduct, and every evil work. That's what the book said. That's what the book says. That's what the book said. The love of money is the root of all evil. I don't care what kind of uh, uh, crime or sin you can think of. The root cause of that is money. The love of money. That's what the book said. You shall lend to many nations, and you shall not borrow. Boy, wouldn't you love to get this thing? You see, if we'd been with God's plans all these years in the past, we'd be in the lending business and not the borrowing business. I think it's time we got it turned around. We're supposed to be. Read some more of that. It gets gooder. And the Lord shall make thee the head. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. I'm tired of being in the back end of this thing. I'm ready to get out front. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not supposed to be the tail. You're supposed to be the head. You're not supposed to have the worst job there is in a company. You're supposed to have the best. Read it. And thou shalt be above only. And that. And thou shalt be above only. And thou shalt not be beneath. And you'll never be below again. Honey, I told you I was going to tell you how to come off of the bottom and get on top. I was going to tell you how to come out of the cellar and get in the living room. The Word of God has given us a way out of this thing. A church can have anything it wants if it'll get God's plan in operation. Stand up and love Him again. You like that? Man, I like it too. You may be seated again. Pastor, if we read any more of that, I'll be here all night preaching on that. And that's, that's just an introduction. 
I'm telling you, you read it when you get home. That gets gooder. That gets gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. I'm telling you, it just don't never quit getting good. The digger you, deeper you dig, the sweeter it gets. But I've got something just as sweet. Moses was spoken to by the Lord and called to the top of Mount Sinai. And while he was there talking to the Lord, the Lord said, Son, I want you to build me a house for my people to come and worship me. Now you're going to be a sojourner in a strange land. This is not where I'm going to have you settled. So I'm going to design for you a portable worship building. And if you'll follow my instructions, it'll be easy to put up and easy to take down, but it'll always be attractive. And everywhere I move on you to stop, the first order of business is to erect my house. And you have the face of that building facing the rising of the sun. And that, that's going to remind you of me every morning. I am your light that comes up in the morning. And I want you to build it just like I command you to build it. Now you're talking about elaborate, honey. Now the temple that Solomon built was by far more elaborate. But when you go to considering the cost of the tabernacle in the wilderness, honey, it wasn't no cheapy. It wasn't just an old tent they pitched here and there. I'm telling you, the carpenter work in that thing was exquisite. The carvings were spectacular. The vessels were handmade. Everything was first class. God don't make no junk. And God don't like junk. Somebody say hallelujah. He said, now, boy, I've given you the blueprints for this. And he did. He gave him the plans for the altar, the plans for the, uh, the labor, the plans for the outside of the building, the plans for the inside of the building, everything in minute detail. You know, it's a strange thing, but God has no respect for building committees. He totally ignored them. Hallelujah. Oh, everybody said, praise God. Boy, that was good, wasn't it? If we ever get all the Baptists out of our Pentecostal churches and all the Methodists out of them, we might be able to have revival. That's right. Well, everybody say, praise God. I said he totally ignored the building committee. Moses was the building committee. And he said, now, boy... I want you to build that house for me, or at least I want you to have it done. The good part about this is the preacher never drove a nail. He did not lay one brick. He didn't saw one board. He didn't cut down one tree. If that had been nowadays, the congregation would have left him because he wouldn't get out there and work. Boy, I'm preaching now, ain't I? And he said, now Moses, I've given you the plan. I want that building built. I want you to get that women together, get the kitchen going, and cook peanut brittle. Oh. Well, all right. We'll cook chicken dinners and peddle them. Well, we'll order donuts from Krispy Kreme and peddle them. I'm tired of the world looking at us as a bunch of peddlers. We're not peddlers. We're the apple of God's eye. When I saw this, I found out how embarrassed I had made God. I have embarrassed God to no end with my tactics. We get out and beg the Philistines to build our houses of worship. I promise you they use not one penny from an unbeliever. All right. Hey, honey, there's something in this plan. Hey, hey, I'm telling you, I've never preached this that a great anointing didn't come over me. If God don't let me be used for nothing else before time for me to go home, baby, he'll help me get some churches turned around. 
Hallelujah. And get to the well, glory to God. Get them out of the financial to well, hallelujah. Well, glory. Now listen, I'm going to use the law of Moses. <laughs> the book said I could. Now if you get mad with this, you get mad with God. I preached this in one church and there's a bunch of them in trouble with God now because they got mad at me over His Word. They didn't hurt me. They're the ones that's suffering. No, they ain't hurting the church. Book of Exodus, chapter 30, beginning at verse number 11. When God gives a man of God a burden to build a house of God and gives him a plan to build it by, he gave him a plan to finance it. And he didn't go down to a bank and sock them in debt for two and a half million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. But God had a simple little plan. And He has never removed that. It has been from, from the time it was written until this day. This plan for building the house of God has never been taken away. It is still in effect. It's just as effective today as tithing. If, if what I'm going to preach tonight is not effective, then tithing is not effective. Because what I'm going to preach is just as effective as tithing. God didn't take the tithing plan out of the Bible. One fellow said, well, you ought not to preach that. That's under the law. I said, well, we preach against women and men's clothes. And the only scripture we got for that is in the Old Testament. Are we going to pre quit preaching against women wearing men's clothes? No, oh, no. Uh -uh. Because that hasn't been removed. The only law that Calvary took care of was the law of sacrifice. He became our lamb. We don't have to buy a lamb anymore. The rest of it. The only, he just became our lamb. He shed his blood. He, he's the lamb whose blood was shed. Uh, the, shed. the law of giving is just as effective uh, as it ever was. Uh, the laws of morality is just as real as they ever were. Begin reading for me, Elder. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And the Lord spoke to the building committee and said, And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, When thou takest the sum of the children, When thou takest, the word sum means money. When thou takest the sum, as you am, of the children of Israel, After their number, after their number, then shall they give. Then shall they give every man, every man a ransom for his soul, for his soul. Unto, the Lord. unto the Lord. It, it, it isn't to Moses. This is to the Lord. <laughs> hey, I got book on you tonight. I got book on you tonight. This is to the Lord. Yes, Say anything you want to about it, but it still says it's for a ransom for our soul. You can't do nothing with that book. Keep reading. When thou, numberest them, when thou numberest them, let there be no plague among them. I promised you last night I was going to show you in the Bible a plan that would eliminate communicable diseases from our midst. That's right. Uh, just to be sure, I was not preaching something unscriptural. I took time today to look up the word plague again. And it was just like it was week before last when I looked it up. It was still contagious disease. It still hasn't changed. And in the entirety of the Old Testament, there is only two places where the word plague is used in this sense. Plague is used many times, but this is, there's only two places where it means contagious disease. And he said, you'll take a ransom from every man for his soul, so there'll be no contagious diseases among you. I said I was going to show you how to keep the flu from spreading through your congregation. Talk to any pastor where I have preached this message, and I'll give you their names, and ask them if they have been plagued by the flu 
since they put this message to practice. Every one of them have told me we have not had near the sickness. We have, and when one gets the flu, it's just one got it. It don't spread through the church anymore now. God said if we do this, he'd take it out from among us. My God, we're the apple of his eye. My God, we're special to him. We mean something to him. Oh, God, yes, sir. Keep reading. That there be no plague among you. When thou numberest them, them, this they shall give. This, and honey, this is a commandment. It's, it didn't say this they can give if they want to out of a free will. They don't have any will about this. This is what they shall give. Everyone that passes, everyone that passeth, among them that are numbered, half a shekel. And I want you to note now. After the shekel of the sanctuary. And then it's going to say that a shekel is 20 geras, but it's in parentheses. Yes, it is. And that means it was not in the original transcripts, but that is an added statement by translators. That was not in the Word of God. Because a shekel in this scripture is not 20 geras. I have looked in 15 different Hebrew dictionaries by different authors and the definition for shekel in this scripture is always a sum of money, but never a specific sum. Because when the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is merely a tithe. That's all it is. Now, if Brother Brown made $100 a week, then a tithe of that, or 10% of that, is a tithe. When he brings it to the house of God, it equates to one shekel. If Brother Hoyt makes $500 a week, then 10% of that is $50. But when he brings it to the house of God, it equates to one shekel. That way no man tithes more than the other. Everybody is equal. Everybody is equal. You see, I told you I was going to show you something. You see, I don't care how much money you make. You can't tithe any more than anybody else in this building. It's impossible. It may be more when you got it, but when it gets to the house of God, it becomes one shekel. It's nothing but a tithe. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. Now, I called an old Hebrew rabbi when I pastored in Florida, and I tried to be respectful to him. He was 80-odd years old, pastored an Orthodox Jewish synagogue. I said, Rabbi, my name is, and I related my name. He said, hey, I've heard of you. You're that preacher that believes in one God, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, boy, you're on the right track. I'll never forget that. He called me boy. All the time, well, I was a boy to him. All the while I talked to him, I was a boy. But I liked that. He said, you're on the right track. He said, now what can I do for you, son? I said, I need a little help understanding a passage in the Old Testament. He said, now you use the King James Version, don't you? I said, yes, sir. I do. He said, excuse me a minute, let me get a copy of the King James. So he evidently removed from where he was sitting, and he, a few moments he returned, he said, all right, uh, son, I have a copy of the King James. What can I help you with now? I said, Exodus chapter 30, where Moses commanded the children of Israel to bring an offering of half a shekel. I said, how much is a half shekel? He said, I don't know. He said, it all depends on how much money you make. I said, now I don't. I said, now in my Bible, they have in parentheses, it's 20 gay rods, but that indicates it was put there by the translator. He said, that bunch of dummies don't know nothing about Hebrew doctrine. Ignore. He said, ignore. I said, well, can you help me with that? He said, well, I've already helped you. I don't know how much it is. I said, well, I, I knew that. I didn't know how much it was either. 
He laughed again. He said, let me see if I can give you an illustration. He said, now, if you make $500 a week, $50 of that $500 goes to the rabbi. That's to take care of him. He said, you folks over there do believe in taking care of your preacher, don't you? I said, well, our church does, but I know some that don't. But that's neither here nor there. He said, all right. If you believe it, he said, a tithe of that is $50. He said, now, when you've got it, it's $50. But when the rabbi gets it, it becomes one shekel. He said, that way, one person can't give any more than another. My God. My God. That's God's word. He said, nobody ever gives any more than the other. And one person can't walk up to the rabbi and say, hey, look, I give you more money than he does. And the rabbi look at the book and say, well, you give one shekel. That's all he gives. He gives one shekel. He gives one shekel. And he said... And he said, a half a shekel is $25 in that case. He gives one shekel. He gives one shekel. And he said, and he said a half a shekel is $25 in that case. I said, that's what I wanted to know. And I said, I thought that's what it was, but I wanted to be sure. Hey, he said, we have always built our synagogues that way. He said, we've always fed our rabbi and always gave our sanctuary offering. And we've never borrowed money to build a synagogue. And he said, we never asked Gentiles to build one either. He told me, he said, a, a Hebrew, an Orthodox Hebrew will not let a Gentile work on his house of worship. He won't let a Gentile give money on his house of worship. He said, lest they say, your God didn't do it. He said, he said, now, Pastor, that's fair. He said, that's fair. He said, now, just suppose the translators were right. And a shekel was 20 gay rods. He said, in our U.S. currency today, that would be approximately, I can't remember the exact amount, some exact amount so this is going to be hypothetical, uh, $150, we'll say. He said, now you've got a little old widow lady in your church. And she cleans houses to make a living. But she makes $15 a day. She works five days a week, so that's $75. He said, that's two weeks of pay. He said, it's impossible to give that each week because she don't make it. But you've got a man in your church that makes $1,000 a week. Why, it's nothing for him. He said, see how unfair it was? But I said, if you got that little widow and she makes $75 a week, her shekel or her tithe is seven fifty. But she tithes one shekel. In the record book, she's got on a faded out print dress. But in the record book, she gave a shekel to the rabbi. But here's the millionaire over here. He gave a shekel to the rabbi. <laughs> Hallelujah. He gave a shekel to the rabbi. And then she gives $3.75, a half shekel. And she's put just as much money on that house of worship as a millionaire has. It's as much her church as it is his church. She's carrying her fair share of the load. Well, somebody shout a little bit. Well, for Brother Brown. Have you ever heard anything like that? In all of my life, I 
I've been in this great truth 33 years plus. I never heard it until God gave it to me. And I began to preach it. And the more I preach it, the more I believe it. And it comes alive in me. Keep reading. Read through verse 16 for me. Oh, Lord. And thou shalt take the atonement money. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel. Of the children of Israel and shalt appoint it for the service. And shall appoint it for the service. Of the tabernacle. Of the congregation. Of the congregation. That it may be a memorial until the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your soul. What you put in to building a house of God is called atonement money. Keep reading. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a labor of bread. Now you missed something there somewhere. Somewhere in there it says, The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less. Read that one. The rich shall not give more. <laughs> Lord. You see, when it's a half shekel, there ain't no way they can give more. The rich shall not give more. And the poor shall not give less. Because when they give half a shekel, that don't make any difference how much money it is. It's still a half shekel. The rich didn't give any more. And the poor didn't give any less. Everybody has an equal part. Honey, I love this message. You like that, Sister Brown? Isn't that beautiful? You see, that's God's way, and He had a way of doing it. He had a way of doing it where one person who was rich couldn't say, That's my church. But that poor little old widow woman could say, That's our church. That's our church. This little gray haired mother can say, I got just as much in that house as anybody there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How much do you tithe? I give my... I tithe one shekel. One shekel. Just one shekel. That's all I tithe. Just a shekel. Because that's a tithe. You see, it's not a certain amount of money. It's just an amount of money. But it's one shekel. Now, that's the key to this. Oh, let's see if it works now. Uh, Exodus 36, beginning at verse number 1. Now, I'm not nearly through, so don't go to getting restless on me. Honey, I'm going to show you where this all comes together in a few minutes. Right. Read that now. One. Begin at verse 1. Then, Let's see if this will work. Let's see if we do it the Bible way, if it will work now. Then wrote Bezalel, Holyab, Brother Carney says Holyab. that other fine gentleman. Okay. In whom the Lord put wisdom. In whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding. To know how to work. To know all how all to work all manner of work for the service. For all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, the building of the house of God, the place. I must pause here and say they didn't have any free labor. You know why we have such shoddy buildings today? Free labor. When you, when you don't, when a person is not paid, you can't hold them responsible for the quality of their work. It's unscriptural to erect a house of worship with free labor. I got book on you tonight. I've got book on you tonight. Hey, they hired, they, they didn't have an automobile mechanic out there doing the electrical work. They had a man out there that was skilled in his trade. Hey, you, you read that carefully. It was men who were filled with wisdom in their trade. That's right. yeah. They didn't take shortcuts to cut down expenses. Everything was the highest quality. Expert workmanship. Keep reading it. And Moses called these men again. And, and Moses called these men. And every wise-hearted man. 
in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one, even every one of them, whose heart stirred, whose heart stirred him up to, to come into the work to, to do come it. to the work to do it. And he, they received a Moses, and they received a Moses. See, they didn't even have a treasure. They didn't have an old Scrooge out there count pennies and say, yeah. he's getting too much. Yeah. Honey, I'm going to tell you something. We get so far away from God's plan, it stinks. All right. yeah. person yeah. asked me one time, preacher was preaching for me, and I don't know why he chose this particular lady to ask about it. He said, is that lady, uh, uh, is she your secretary? I said, my what? He said, is that your secretary? Does she keep up with the tithing? I said, tithing? I said, now my wife don't count my money. I know some other woman ain't going to count it. I said, don't nobody in this church need to know who tithes and who don't but me. I'm the only one that knows who tithes and who don't. I'll never forget one time I shared this with Pastor Hort a few nights ago. A lady gave, my, gave her tithing to my wife one night. And my wife brought them to me and here's so-and-so's tithe. I said, I don't want them. Take them and give, her, give them back to her and tell her that you don't collect tithe. You're not the pastor. I'm the pastor. <coughs> she never did it again. You can't get Sister Pilot to take a tithe and envelope. You, you won't get her to take a tithe and envelope. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. I'm telling you. Hey, if we ever, if we ever get, if we ever get, if we ever get our churches in harmony with this old book, you talk about a revival. What business? What business has a church member got knowing who ties and who don't? It ain't none of that cotton picking business. Who ties? Their shepherd is the only one that knows, needs to know who tithe. And when they tithe, they all tithe the same amount. I don't care how much they make. One shekel. One shekel. Hallelujah. We ought to send our ass in a tailspin and put in record books. One shekel. And when they come in and say, what's that? Say, you figure it out, buddy. You're the smart in it. Hallelujah. Well, somebody said, praise God. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Some of you might not like, honey, but I got book on you. I, I got book on you. The building fund money came through Moses. That's what the book said. He's the one that paid the workmen. That way, that way one of their buddies couldn't come in and do a halfway job and get paid anyhow. Couldn't borrow money on future work. Right, yeah. Yeah, they gave all the offerings. Read it. And they received of Moses all the offerings. And they received, they, the children of Israel brought the offering to Moses. And the workmen came to Moses to get their pay. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And they brought unto him yet free offerings every morning. Hey, now, why in the name of God did they get all of that money out there in the wilderness? If God can bless people like that in the wilderness, where there's no factories and no jobs, uh, what in the name of the Lord can He do uh, when you in this city, if you'll get in harmony with His plan? That's good. I mean to tell you, it just came in from everywhere. Keep reading. And they spake unto Moses. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough. The people are bringing more than enough. For the service of the work. They're bringing too much to build this building. Which the Lord commanded, to which the Lord commanded us to build. Mm. You've never heard that before. It's because we've never got in harmony with this book. The only reason we have to have, we, we never get in harmony with his book, so we never have enough money. But God, may, we, we, we run out before we get the floor built. But when we do it God's way, before they got up, he said, we ain't got enough. We got way too much. 
We got too much money. We don't want any more. My God, wouldn't you like to hear that? Instead of two or three offerings in one night, somebody say, hey, we got enough. We don't need no more. Change around. Honey, this thing will work. Read it, brother. Keep reading. Go through verse 7. Am I doing all right, church? Hallelujah. For the stuff they had was sufficient. For the stuff they had was sufficient. For all the work. For all the work. To make it. And too much. Lord. Honey, you ain't never heard that before. And when I put this message together, it was that same way when Solomon built the temple. And, every, and, and if you go to talking to an Orthodox Jew, every time they go to build a synagogue, it's still the same way. Because they still do it the Old Testament way. God's way. You don't never see a Jew on the corner selling peanut brittle to build a house of God. You don't never see them out there peddling chicken dinners. You don't see them. You don't see them out there like a bunch of peddlers. That's right. That's right. And I loved it when that old rabbi said, "And we don't take money from Gentiles to build our house either. We don't want, unless they say we built that synagogue." Hey, when you peddle peanut brittle and sell chicken dinners and donuts, the city can say, we built that church. We built that church. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, I got Holy Ghost all over my bone. Do you like this, sis? I just get up and dance a little bit. I want to see. Can you dance? If you, if you couldn't, you can now. Just try. My God, I knew that woman could dance. Somebody else do it. I just knew she wanted to do it. My God, have mercy. You may be seated again. Just read through verse 7, and then I'm going to change. That's all, right. all right, I want you to go to the book of Malachi now, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. You see, what, usually when we preach from Malachi, we preach two little verses and leave the rest of it out. Hey, this is too pretty. I'm going to show you where God rebuked Israel because they had gotten away from His plan. If you read the book of Jeremiah, their priest had gone in the fields to work. Because the people had quit tithing. And the house of God lay in waste because they quit giving offerings. It's in the book. It's in the book. When a congregation is big enough to have their own house to worship in, it's big enough to take care of the priest, and it's big enough to take care of their own house. Thank you. Hallelujah. If you wanted a house of worship... Uh, bad enough that you, you're, you're over here now and you've chosen Brother Brown to be your shepherd, you're large enough to take care of him. And I'll guarantee you one thing, you get in harmony with this book and this man won't have to get out his carpenter tools. Right. Uh, uh, you, get plan, you get in harmony with this plan I'm preaching right now and I'll guarantee you, you can pay your bills around here and there'll be enough money for you to live off of. That's right. I believe it. Hey, it'll do it. There'll be an, I, I don't know how God does it, but I know He'll do it. I, I've seen it. Oh, well, praise God. I've seen it too many times. I've preached this in churches where pastors was having to preach off to make a living. And give all, the, uh, give all of their income back to pay church bills. I preached it to their churches and preached it. And the church has turned completely around. The pastor can live like he's supposed, supposed to now. And they have money in the treasury. Right. For the first time in years, they have surplus to pay their bills. And everybody gives the same amount. One person is not responsible for carrying the load. Everybody shares. Begin at verse number one. Now this pastor here, 
I really want him to come tonight because he can he's talk to almost every pastor I have preached this far. And every one of them are telling the exact same story. I mean, there's not one of them that it don't work. It works. I pastored a little old lady who worked in a plant nursery for minimum wage. And that's when it was $2.80 an hour in a plant nursery. When I preached this, she came out of a Baptist church and prayed through to the Holy Ghost. I baptized her. She started coming to church with us in 1974. In 1980, God gave me this plan. The first time I preached it, that little girl who'd come out of the Baptist church grabbed hold of it. The very next payday, her tithe was there, and one half of her tithe was Mark Temple offering. We had another man in that same church who was a masonry contractor, made $1,500 a week. He tithed, but he wouldn't give an offering. And that rascal had to borrow money every week from that little woman that worked for minimum wage to make it to payday. I'm, t I'm telling you a truth. I'm telling you a truth. Every week, his, he, said, I, he told me, he said, I don't know where my money goes. He said, I'm going to have to go back and see sister again. I said, you mean to tell me that you make $1,500 a week and you're going over there borrowing money from that woman that works for $2.80 an hour in a plant nursery? He said, I don't know where she's getting all of it, but she's got more money than anybody I've ever seen. I said, I'll tell you where she's getting it. You tied what? She's getting to God and you're holding out on him. You're robbing him and God's blessing her and cursing you. God was blessing her and cursing him. Well, her daughter, now her husband left her with two kids. And oh, he was so liberal, he gave her $250 a week to support, two, a month to support two kids on. And he made $700 a week, scallywag. Uh, yeah. uh, if he ever gets the Holy Ghost, he'll have to go back and pay all that back stuff up right. yeah. to get right with God. Because if you don't provide for your own house, you're worse than an infidel. I don't care how much you talk in tongues. Well, anyway, she went to work when she was in the 11th grade. And her mother said, honey... This is your first job now. You remember one thing. We got food in the cupboard, a car in the driveway, and you have good clothes to wear because we have always treated God's right. She said, now you remember, whatever your gross amount of pay is, one-tenth of that goes to our pastor. Don't you ever spend it for nothing else. That goes to our pastor. That's for him to live off of. And whatever that is, one half of that goes for the upkeep of our church. Don't ever misuse that money. Two years out of high school, four years later now, and she worked at a, at a, a souvenir shop in a hotel, and they didn't have to pay minimum wage. She worked for $2 an hour in high school, part-time. Two years out of high school, she got a job at a place where they sell parts for uh, expensive watches, clocks, etc. Runs a computer for them. I don't know just what she does, but she'd been working there two years. And her daddy had given her an old Rambler. If I was going to give anybody a car, it wouldn't be a Rambler. they better off without one. I had that thing. I had, I had one. I had it set in my backyard. I told a friend of mine, I said, that's a Christian science car. Yeah. He said, what do you mean? I said, you just think you got a car. <laughs> <laughs> you just Lord. think you got one. Oh, <laughs> well, anyway, she wanted to get rid of that. She said, Brother Pilate, my daddy don't care enough about me 
to go with me to pick out a car. Would you go with me? She said, car dealers mistreat women. And, and she said, if you'd go with me, I'd feel safe in buying. Well, I thought she wanted to buy her a small car, like a Ford Escort or something like that. And I said, are you interested in a small car? She said, Lord, no, Brother Bob. If It might be that I have to die in an automobile accident. And I don't want to die in a bunch of tin made in Japan. I want a car. I said, well, honey, what do you want? She said, I want a Ford Thunderbird. I want the digital speed out, readout speedometer. I want power steering, power brakes, power windows, power seats, console, AM and FM stereo console. And I want, I want black lacquer paint on it and velour interior. I said, well, honey, uh, do you think you can handle the payments on it? She said, oh, yeah. I didn't say nothing else. That was enough. I knew she came from good stock, and she'd never go in debt for something she couldn't handle. So we found her what she wanted. 86 model Ford Thunderbird fit her uh, description to a T, very low miles. I bickered around. I got them to sell it to her, just $120 above loan value. I said, honey, now this is as low as they're going to sell it. If you want it, buy it. She said, I'll take it. I told her how much it was going to be, so we went in, and I said to the my sales manager, I said, she's going to take the Thunderbird. He said, good. We'll need to fill out a credit application. She said, why? He said, well, you are going to finance it, aren't you? She said, well, I wasn't planning on it. He said, well, how was you going to play for it? She said, well, I was going to give you a check, if that'd be all right. Oh, he said, yeah, yeah. Now, this is on Friday night. He said, we'll be glad to uh, take your check. But said, you know, our company policy is that... Uh, uh, we'll have to hold your, uh, keep the car here to Monday, and we will verify the, your check. He said, I know it's good, but that's just, you know how they lie. I said, that's just company policy. He she said, oh, said, there's no problem there. And the little old young un unbuttoned her, un popped her purse, and she pulled out a notarized letter from the bank president guaranteeing her check for up to $10,000. <laughs> Paid cash for it. Two years out of high school, and I mean paid cash for it. And I just got off of the telephone with her mother this afternoon. And she's wiring, or, or mailing me a cashier's check to go to a sale with Brother Jeff Dykes the next few days and buy another brand new Thunderbird. I said, what you going to do with yours, darling? She said, I think I'll just give it to my mother. She's been so good to me. I think I'll just give it to Mama. Well, you can't beat that, honey. But I tell you what, when she was a girl, she got with God's plan. And she's never left God's plan. Somebody holler hallelujah. And I built their house farm. I oversaw the work. I was a bit, I, I was, you know, I didn't do any work. I, I just hired subcontractors. And the day they moved in that house, everything was paid for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has never, I've talked to her pastor, and he said, Brother Pilot. Could you get me about another 150 saints like that woman and that little girl? He said, I'm telling you. He said, that girl wears the prettiest dresses. Said she wears a pair of new shoes every day. She is always dressed to a T. And said, uh, uh, neither one of them. Said, uh, they just look like they're the richest people in our church. And said, they have always got money. Mm. Always got money. Well, I had another lady. Her husband left her with three kids. Now, in 1979, I went with this lady to the welfare department and helped her get on welfare. I did. Left with three kids, three months house rent, two light bills, and not a bite of groceries in the house. The church helped them all we could. 
Because we wasn't on God's plan then. I didn't know it. But I sure was groping for it. When I got hold of this, I taught six weeks. I taught six weeks on God's plan. Loretta Farrell. Support on state assistance. Stayed on it for a year. When I finished those six weeks of, 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 of Bible lessons, Loretta Farrell walked up to me and she said, According to what you've been preaching, I deserve better than I've got. And she said, I'm not going to recertify for welfare. On her way home from church, this is where her own testimony, she saw a lawnmower on a trash heap. Stopped and had the little boy to go ask the people if she could have that lawnmower. The man said, you can have that one and there's another one in the garage you can have. We've got somebody to do our lawn maintenance and you can have both of them. Neither one of them would run. That girl carried those to her mother, her daddy, and he took both of them and made one good one. Monday morning, Loretta Farrell and those three kids got out on the streets of Orlando and went from house to house. Could we mow your lawn? At the end of that week, she made over six. Was, I know she made $600 because her tithe was $60 and her temple offering was $30. The first week. The first week. Made $600. And she'd go up to houses and they'd say, would you like for us to mow your grass? And people say, well, we have a maintenance service that does this for us. But I said, I think I'll just let you go ahead and cut it anyway. I, I, I mean, people, people would just let her do it, and they had maintenance service. And today, Loretta Farrell owns three of the largest nursing homes in the city of Orlando. She is a millionaire today. Loretta Farrell is a millionaire. And she still stays with that plan. She said, God got me off of welfare. I'd be spitting in his face to mistreat him now. <laughs> Honey, I could tell you story after story. The only people I don't want to tell about is them that rejected God's plan and where they went. Begin reading. Boy, this gets gooder and gooder. I hope you like long messages because this one's going to last a little longer. Chapter 3, verse 1. Malachi. Behold, I will send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord. All I am is a messenger. That's all you are. And we're preparing people for the coming of the Lord. Yes. Keep reading. And the Lord. Now I want you to notice. This is talking about the coming of the Lord. Whom ye seek. And the Lord whom you seek. Shall suddenly come to That you. Lord you've been praying. Oh God come down among us. Do great things among us. Shall suddenly appear. Yes. Even the messenger. Even the messenger. The covenant. The, uh oh. All I have been preaching tonight is the covenant of God. All right. That's all I am preaching yes. Yes. is the covenant. The covenant yes. That's all I'm preaching. A messenger of the covenant. Keep reading. Whom you delight in. Whom you delight in. Behold. Behold. He shall come. He shall come. Saith the, the Lord of hosts. But. But. Who may abide the day of his coming? Who will accept the message when he brings it? Keep reading. And who shall stand when he appears? And who shall stand when Christ appears? Keep reading. For he is like a refiner's he, The fire. one that's going to appear is like a refiner's fire. And like fuller's and like soap. Fuller soap. Yes. Keep reading. And he shall sit as a refiner. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier purify of, of silver. And he shall purify. And he shall start with the preachers. The sons of Levi. We're never going to get away from the doldrums that we're in until preachers live by the message. That's right. I believe it. I believe. Praise God. Every pastor I have preached this far has put this in. Here's what they do. Their, their income, they take a tithe off of it and they set it aside for the ministry. And then they take 5% and that's for the temple. Yeah. 
All of them are doing it. Yeah. Brother James Carney does it in Columbia. Yeah. Brother Kenneth Lott does it over at Pedal. I, 11, pre, Brother Merle Ewins do it in Lake Charles. Brother, uh, Brother George Guy is doing it in Vidalia. Brother, uh, Brother Jerry Cox is doing it over at Pine. Everywhere I've ever preached it, the preacher said, hey, I like that. And I'm going to do it. And I mean, they have started doing it. I do it. I'm going to purify the sons of Levi. That's the ministry. I'm going to start with the preachers. Keep, re keep reading. But we're not really purified until we get our churches doing it. Keep reading. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. Purify the sons of Levi. And purge them as gold and, and, purge them as gold and silver. That they may offer them to the Lord. Uh-oh. And that they may offering uh, unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. In righteousness. Everything we give under our present system is unrighteous. Because it's not in harmony with that plan. It's all in our giving. We're in the shape we're in. It's all on our giving. Right back to our giving. And they shall offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness as what now? And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. In righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem, be, the church, be, be, it, pleasant, unto the be Lord, pleasant unto the Lord as in the days, as of, old, in the days of old. And as, in and, former, and, and as in former years, pointing right back to the beginning. They, have, they had left it. They had left his plan. And God said it's going to be pleasant again. God said it's going to be pleasant. Oh, and, and this gets better. Keep reading. And I will come near to you. And then, wait a minute. I want you to look now. Then he said, and I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness. And I will be a swift witness. The against the sorcerer and against the adulterer. Uh, you're talking about a clean church. Pastor won't have to get his hands dirty. He won't have to do a thing but preach the word of God. When we get out, and it all started with our giving. All of this revolves around an offering. All of this is around giving. You talk about gossipers having a hard day, honey. Every church that begins to institute God's plan like it was in the beginning, you won't have gossipers no more. God said He'd be a swift witness against them. You won't have to worry about people falling in adultery. God will take care of them. You won't have to worry about these witches that creep in and sow discord and strife among your family. He said, I'll take care of the sorcerers. He said, I'll be a swift witness against them. Those that oppress the hireling in his wages. Hey, and if you work for somebody and they're mistreating you on the job in your wages, God said, I'll take care of them. Yeah. The widow. I'll take care of the widow. Yeah. And the father. I'll take care of the orphans. My God. Keep reading. And that turn aside the stranger. And that turn aside the stranger right. from what belongs to him. Hey, there won't be no more. When we get our churches right, there won't be no more mistreating. Uh -uh. God's. Hey, Hey, all of this is yeah. about an offering. Yeah. Brother, love it. This revolves around nothing but an offering. It started with an offering. It started with a preacher doing it. And then here comes the offering. It's pleasant. And that's when God says, I'll clean the church up. Keep reading. Then he says, fear not me. Fear not me. Says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I change, I change not. Hey, God has not changed. He said right here, I don't change. The offering I wanted back then, I want it now. Hallelujah. I don't change. I change not. I don't change my plan. Keep reading. Even from the days of your fathers. Even from the days of your fathers. You have 
gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. And you haven't kept mine ordinances. Return unto me. Return unto me. How are you going to? And I will return unto you. And the way to return here is in our giving. Yes. Yes. We're in shall we return? Wherein shall we return? They said. Will a man rob God? And then he said, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me in tithe yes. and offerings. People tithe, but they never get their offering right. And, and the book said you are cursed well, you with a curse because you have robbed me, this whole nation. Now there's the reason why our people stay in poverty. They tithe, but their offerings are not there. And they're cursed. And it ain't their fault. It's ours. I can't blame nobody but me. I preach this in every church I go to now. As a matter of fact, I have about a hundred invitations just for one night to preach this. Yes, sir. That's right. I'm serious. I'm not talking about revivals. I have at least a hundred invitations just to come one night and preach this. Because we've been wrong so long. And we want to get back in harmony with Him. We want to get back in harmony with God. We want to get back in harmony. Let's love Him a little bit. Read me a little more of that. Read us a little more of that, brother. Hey, I'm, I'm telling you, this gets better yet. You talk about something being beautiful. Keep reading it, Elder. Bring ye all the tithes into the store. Well, said it didn't say nothing about offerings. Well, if you don't tithe, you sure ain't going to bring an offering. Uh -huh. right. Start with a tithe. Mm -hmm. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be beat in my house. Keep and reading. Prove. And prove me now. Hear what saith the Lord. And here's the reason the blessings are promised and we've never got them. We've wanted for doing half of what God said. All right. Just doing it halfway. Yes. Paid our tithe, but never gave our offering. We've looked after the preacher, but neglected the house. My God, my God. And it laid destitute. And we got more unscriptural because the preacher had to take his income and keep the house going. And that wasn't pleasing to him. Keep reading. I'm guilty, but not since 1980. Prove me now. Here. I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive it. Hey, that's a promise. If you get with this plan of God's, He has given His Word. Yes. I'll bless you. You can't even receive it. That's right. But you can't get it on tithing only. No, sir. No, sir. That's God's man already. You got to do it all. Preachers got to do it. My God, yes. Keep on. Yes. He said, I'll rebuke the devourer. He said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Yes. Last, and he's, last year, I planted a little old garden just to make it. Our next door neighbor's a nosy old busybody. She came over and said, Oh, you're going to plant a garden. I saw them plant tomatoes. She said, Well, I can tell you right now, you better put a lot of poison on them because bugs eat them up around here. I said, They won't eat my tomatoes. Mm -hmm. She said, What kind of tomatoes you planting that bugs won't eat? I don't know what kind. They are just tomatoes. She said, Well, I'll tell you one thing. If you don't put powder on them, bugs will eat them. I said, Lady, Bugs can't eat my tomatoes. <laughs> she said, well, I want to know your secret. I said, I live according to God's word, and he promised he would not let the devourer get them. Right. Hey, brother, God is my witness. I never put one drop of poison on my tomatoes, and, and she'd come out. When the vines came up, she'd come out every day to look for bugs. <laughs> she kept her alive. Hear this I, I mean, she came out and could not find a bug or a worm on my tomatoes. And I planted them in five-gallon buckets and hung them up. I, I, I don't want to go into all that, but I had them hanging on a swing set. 
so my wife could just stand and pick them off. I'm telling you, bugs didn't bother my tomatoes. I, I, I live according to this plan. And I'm, I, I've got a right to believe that God's going to keep the worms off of mine. Hey I, hey, I live by that. i got a right to expect I get the benefits of it. If you live by this, you can expect to get the benefits. Glory to my God. Read a little, my God, I can't hardly stand it. Stand up, let me finish this. I'm about to have a fit. For all nations. For all nations. Shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land. Saith the Lord. What? Your word. Your word. Have been strong against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say. What we spoken. What have we spoken? What have we spoken? And all it was was about offerings. Nothing but money. That's all they want's money. If we'd get with God's plan. If we'd get with God's plan. One pastor told me the other day, he said, Man, since we start, we've instituted that plan, I've quit taking up offering on Wednesday night. He said, he said, we don't even have to take up an offering during midweek services now. He, he said, I'm, I'm, he said I, now I'm telling you what he told me. He said, he said, the way our people's doing now, I'll never take up another evangelistic offering because we, we got, we going to have more money. We got more money. Than we. He said, I have never seen nothing like it. He said, I would have never believed we could get that much money. But he said, my God, God's blessing us. Our people are getting jobs. Our people are being healed. Our people are being blessed. My God, I'm telling you now, honey, you can't afford to miss this plan. Brother Brown, I don't know how you plan to implement this, but this is the way every pastor. Now, I normally preach this on Sunday morning. I don't want to sound like I think I'm important. I don't mean it that way. I did not have a, I did not have a weekend. I could be with you folks to way over in November. And you needed this message. Yeah. All right. Sure we do. Sure we do. That's right. And that's why I called Brother Brown. This good man asked me over a year ago. Over a year ago. Just any of your off nights come and preach for it. And, and I had two off nights. I had two off nights last night and tonight. And Brother Pullins wanted me to come over there and preach tomorrow night. 